Welcome to Expound, our weekly worship and verse-by-verse study of the Bible. Our goal is to expand your knowledge of the truth of God by explaining the Word of God in a way that is interactive, enjoyable, and congregational. We call this a textual community. Let's rejoice and learn God's Word in an interactive and enjoyable new way. Matthew 21, let's pray together. Our Father, as we gather tonight and we give you our attention because we do believe that the Holy Spirit of God is ultimately our teacher. You have provided the scriptures, in this case, the stories of the life of Jesus, your son, as told to us by Matthew, a follower of Christ in those earlier years. It's a message to us, it's timeless. It's the Word of God, it's the Scripture. There are principles that apply to us today in our situation. So we pray that as part of our worship, we would give you our attention. We would surrender and submit, as we heard in that opening clip, to the authority of Scripture. And let no distraction be upon us, but all the attention be given to you for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I've often thought about those early disciples who followed Jesus and what it must have been like, especially when Jesus would tell them odd things, weird things. They began to question why he would do that until after a while they just learned Don't ask Jesus questions when he tells you to do something. For example, when they were out in the wilderness and there were thousands of people gathering and there was no food, and Jesus said, well, you you give them something to eat, Philip. The disciples scratched their heads and go, oh, well, we don't have any food. And one starts calculating how much money it would take and Jesus said, well, how much food you got? He goes, well, there's a kid here with a few loaves bread and some fish. And Jesus said, bring them to me. And they're thinking, bring them to me? What's that about? What are they among so many was their rebuttal. Or the time when Jesus was sitting in the boat, had just preached a message, and then he said, Peter, launch out into the deep that we might have a catch of fish. And Peter goes, Lord, I've been fishing all night. We didn't catch anything. The time to fish is at night. It's not now in the middle of the day. It doesn't work. Again, a rebuttal. Nevertheless, at your word, we'll just do it. We'll humor you. And they caught a huge catch of fish so that the nets began to break. Or the time when the question came to Peter, does your master pay the temple tax? So the IRS is coming now on Peter. And Jesus says, Peter, go down to the lake and catch a fish and open its mouth. There'll be a coin, exactly the right amount to pay your taxes. So after a while, when Jesus says, do something, it's like, just do it. Don't bug him or ask him any questions or have a rebuttal against what he said. And we come to a situation like that here in Matthew chapter 21 in what is called the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on a donkey. He's going to make a request that they go into a village and he'll set up the scenario of what they're to ask for and if there's an argument from the owners of this donkey, these two donkeys, what to say. And there's no argument here. They're learning their lesson. When Jesus gives you a command, just do what he says. We are now dealing with the final week of Jesus' life. And look at where you are in your Bible. You're in Matthew 21. There are 28 chapters in this book. Two-fifths of the entire real estate in the book of Matthew is devoted to the final week of Jesus and going to the cross. So you can see what the emphasis is of this writer. Okay, let's just catch up. Where has Jesus been? 
Well, he has come from Galilee. He crossed over the Jordan River to the east side to an area technically called Perea, which is modern-day Jordan. And he engaged in ministry there for several months. Then, at the right moment, he turns his face toward Jerusalem, and he makes his ascent upward topographically to the city of Jerusalem for his crucifixion. He goes through Jericho, you remember, and he meets two blind men, as opposed to three blind mice. Two blind men, one of them named Bartimaeus, because he was the most notable. He healed them, and then he continues his way upward toward Jerusalem, ascending, because Jericho is down by the Dead Sea, very low, lowest spot on the face of the earth. They're going to Jerusalem, about 2,500 feet above sea level. They're coming in climbing up the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. And they come to two towns, one called Bethany and the other called Bethphage. Bethany is where Lazarus lived and Mary and Martha. That's where Jesus would often stay when he would come to town. The other city right next to it, Bethphage, means the House of Figs, located both of them a couple miles outside the old city walls of Jerusalem. And so we begin in verse 1. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bet Faje, which means House of Figs in Hebrew, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt, that is a young donkey, with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says to you, or says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now, wouldn't this be great if it worked for other things? Like a car? You could just go to the lot, pick one out, and say, I want this one. The Lord has need of it. Here's the keys, man. <laughs> How cool would that be? Or groceries. The Lord has need of these. Something that you should make a note of, the story that we're reading, this triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, is mentioned in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John take this story and tell it in their version, giving slightly different details in each, but you get the composite by all four. Now, that's noteworthy because we've discovered already that so often the Gospel writers would write about certain things and leave out stories or events, but here is an event that all four Gospel writers tell us which tells me that God wants us to get this story. You know, sometimes the Lord would repeat things twice for emphasis. Verily, verily, I say unto you. In Greek, amen, amen, which means, hey, listen up. And then every now and then the Lord would repeat something three times, like in Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy came the message of that vision that Isaiah saw. So the one attribute God wants you to know about him is what? That he is holy. But when God repeats something four times, you got to know he wants you to understand it. So this is Matthew's rendition. All this was done, verse 4, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a colt, a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from trees and spread them on the road. And then the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, 
Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now just soak it in for a moment. This is an historic moment. This is a prophetic moment. This is something that had been anticipated or should have been anticipated by the entire nation of Israel, and I'll tell you why in a moment. All right, the season is what feast? Passover. At Passover, the city of Jerusalem would swell, Josephus tells us, sometimes to five times its population base. In the writings of the historian Flavius Josephus, he says that one Passover around this era, 256,000 lambs were slaughtered in the temple courts. That's a quarter million lambs. The Jewish minimum was 10 people per one lamb, which would mean the population of Jerusalem if those renderings are accurate, could have swelled to about two and a half million people. It was very, very crowded. Hospitality was big because crowds from all over came. I mentioned that Jesus often stayed with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus on the other side of the Mount of Olives, but sometimes he would just spend the night in the open, like around the Garden of Gethsemane, because the Bible says he often went there to pray. So the city was crowded, and the best thing that we can think of for that is what festival in October is our city really crowded? The Balloon Fiesta, can't find a hotel room. Traffic is crazy, especially early morning and evening time because of the balloons. So that's the situation going here. Now it was every Jew's dream to celebrate Passover at least once in your lifetime in the city of Jerusalem. At the end of every Seder feast, no matter where you celebrate it, whether it's Albuquerque, Albany, New York, or Argentina, at the end you say, next year, be Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. Next year in Jerusalem, God willing, it's my hope that one day, maybe next year will be the year I'll get to go to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover. So pilgrims have flooded in. The event we're reading took place on a Sunday. We call it Palm Sunday. In the Hebrew calendar, it was the 10th day of the month Nisan, N-I-S-A-N, if you happen to be taking notes. On the 10th day of the month Nisan, that's when the Jewish people would select the lamb that they were going to offer for the Passover sacrifice, and that lamb would be prepared. As Jesus comes into the city, the crowds surround him, and they shout out a word that's familiar to us, Hosanna. It comes to us from Psalm 118. It's a messianic psalm. Hosanna means deliver or save now, Lord. Help us, Lord. Deliver us, Lord. Save us now. Do for us, Jesus, what our religion has been unable to do. You are the Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the son of David. They recognized him as their Messiah. Now that sounds really promising, except a few days later, no doubt many of the people in this same crowd are going to be the ones that will shout out, crucify him, crucify him. So crowds can be very fickle. But at this point, they're recognizing that he's their Messiah. That's their hope. Now keep in mind, the reason they would go from Hosanna to crucify him is because Jesus didn't give them what they wanted. They wanted deliverance from Rome. They wanted a physical deliverance from the yoke and bondage of Roman oppression. They didn't want a crucified Savior dying for their sins. They want real tangible help. Overthrow the Roman government and you're the guy. That's their hope as he comes in. Now he's riding on a donkey. Why? Is it because he's just tired? Is it because he said, boys, I've always wanted a donkey ride into Jerusalem. They're cool. No. Matthew tells us the reason is to fulfill 
what was anticipated, a prophecy by the prophet Zechariah. In chapter 9 of that little book in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, is the announcement. Shout, O daughter of Zion, for behold, your king is coming to you. He is lowly and having salvation, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So it was predicted that he would come this way. Something that is helpful to know is that oftentimes kings, when they were fighting a battle or had won victory through a battle, would come on a white horse. If they were going to war, they would go on a horse, a charger. But if it was times of peace or offering peace, the king would sometimes come in a lowly fashion, like the common people, on a donkey. So here is Jesus coming at his first coming on a donkey, offering salvation, bringing terms of peace to the world. At his second coming, Revelation 19 tells us, Jesus comes on a white horse to make war and to stop the rebellion against God that will take place during that period of time. So at his first coming, he comes in peace. At his second coming, he will come to judge and make war. Something else you need to know. It's not recorded here. It's going to be recorded. It is recorded in Luke's gospel, but who knows when we'll get to that. So let's just cover it. Same event. Luke tells us that in, when Jesus comes in on the day we're reading about, he weeps over the city of Jerusalem, and he makes a proclamation that he is holding the nation accountable to know that day that had been predicted. In Luke 19, it reads that Jesus said, if you had known, even you, in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but they are hidden from your eyes. And now your enemies will come in and cast an embankment around you and close you in on every side, predicting the fall of Jerusalem that will happen in 70 AD. Listen to what he says. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. Or the NIV says, because you didn't know the time of God coming to you. So he said, you should have known what day this is. You don't know what day this is. You're going to be judged because you didn't know the time of your visitation. What day is he speaking of? What time is he referring to? Now I need your full attention. He's holding them accountable to be aware of a prophecy that had been given to them in their own writings in the Old Testament that predicted the coming of the Messiah. Did you know that there was a, a prediction made that gave the exact day that the Messiah would be presented to the Jewish nation? In fact, he's called in that passage Messiah the Prince. I'm referring to, of course, Daniel chapter 9. There's four incredible verses. I would consider them the most important prophetic verses in all of the Bible. That's quite a statement. Daniel had been praying in chapter 9, wondering about the future of the nation. He had been reading his Bible. His devotions were in the book of Jeremiah, and he read in Jeremiah that there would be 70 years of captivity. And he's looking through his calendar, and he goes, well, what do you know? We've been in captivity about 70 years. It's about time for us to go home. 70 years is almost up. As he prays, he gets a revelation from God, a timetable for their future. Now listen to what it says. 70 weeks are determined for your people, for your holy city, to finish the transgression, to put an end of sin, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know this and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to build and restore Jerusalem until 
Messiah the Prince shall be 483 years. Now just think about that. You with me so far? A prediction is made that a commandment will be given. And from the very date that the commandment is given, 483 years will pass, called in Hebrew, 69 weeks, because it says 70 weeks are determined. In Hebrew, it's, it's Sebuim Shevim, which literally is 70 sevens. And almost every scholar looking at that says it refers to weeks of years or sets of years. So once again, keep in mind, a prediction is made that a commandment will be given to restore and build Jerusalem that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. They've been in captivity for 70 years. Daniel gets the revelation that a commandment will be given in the future to restore and build Jerusalem. And from that time on, 483 years or 69 sets of seven will transpire until Mashiach is in Hebrew, Nagid, the Messiah, the Prince. And then it goes on to say in that prophecy in Daniel, most amazing prophecy, then the Messiah will be cut off, a word for killed. Very explicit. It's a curious prediction. And it's a prediction that got one scholar researching it. And the scholar that I'm talking about was a guy who used to be head of the criminal division of Scotland Yard. His name was Sir Robert Anderson. He wrote a pretty thick book called The Coming Prince. It's all mathematical computations. He says, he goes back in history and he finds the date that Artaxerxes Longimanus made the decree that the Jews can build not only the temple, but the entire city, rebuild the city as well as their place of worship. And that date is clearly fixed in history as March 14th, 445 BC. So Sir Robert Anderson took out, I was gonna say his calculator, it didn't happen back then, his pencil and his little brain. And he started counting 483 years from March 14th, 445 BC. Now he reckoned not 365 days per year, that's how we count our years, 365 and a third day, that's the Julian calendar. But when the Bible was written, they weren't working off the Julian calendar, but the Babylonian calendar of 360 days per year. So the first thing that Anderson did was to calculate 483 years using 360 day years, he accounted for leap years and etc. went all through history and it's in his book. And he came up with this, 173,880 days is precisely 483 years or 69 sets of seven. So he started counting from March 14th, 445 BC, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I don't worry, I won't go, 173,880 days. And the 173,880th day just happened to be April 6, 32 AD, or the 10th of Nisan, when Jesus said to his disciples, go into that village and get me a donkey. I'm fulfilling not only Zechariah 9.9, but Daniel chapter 9. Know this and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, will be 173,880 days exactly. It's an amazing book. It's an amazing prediction. No wonder Jesus said, if only you would have known the things that make for your peace in this, your day. You didn't know the time of your visitation. He held them accountable to know that date. And so he wept for the city because he knew what would happen in their future when the Romans would take it over. Verse 10, 
And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And so the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Now, it could be that tonight here in this room, we have some very clever, well-read Bible students. And we've just read that passage. You go, now, now wait a minute, Skip. I, I do remember you teaching the Gospel of John recently. And according to the Gospel of John, Jesus drove out these money changers in the temple at the beginning of his ministry. And here Matthew says it happened at the end of his ministry. And you might even be saying, aha, contradiction. That wouldn't be wise. Because John records the incident that happened at the beginning of his ministry. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics, record the incident that happened at the end of his ministry. There were two separate incidents. Jesus came representing his father as the Lord of the covenant. I'll explain that term in a moment. At the beginning of his ministry, they didn't learn their lesson. He comes again at the end of his ministry. Slightly different variations, same idea. He comes in and he overturns the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Now, is Jesus just having a bad day? Is this like, well, he's got real anger issues, this Messiah. He needs to take the class when good men get angry. Not at all. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. Jesus was not exhibiting sinful anger, but rightful, righteous anger. He's exercising his rightful authority as the Messiah of Israel, God's representative over God's house. Now listen to what Malachi said. Remember Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament that predicted the coming of John the Baptist. It said this, Malachi 3. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, and he will sit as a refiner and a purifier. This was all predicted. He had divine prophetic rights to come, and he did twice, at the beginning and at the end of his ministry. The Lord whom you seek will come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. That's who Jesus was. Okay, here's the deal. Just so you understand why Jesus would do this, like, man, this is radical. Sort of like if Billy Graham came in and just started pushing pulpits over in churches. Whoa! Here's the deal. People would come to Jerusalem. I said it was a dream of every Jewish person to go there for Passover at least once. He would go up there, and sometimes they would bring animals. Sometimes they wouldn't bring an animal. Not to worry. As Apple would say, we have an app for that. And sometimes they would come but didn't have the right kind of currency because they came from a foreign country. And so, once again, not to worry, we have an app for that. They would sell you an animal in the temple precincts for a lot more than you could get it anywhere else at an exorbitant rate. And if you had different money than the money that was accepted, there was only two types of money that was accepted, the temple coin minted in Jerusalem and the Galilean shekel or the Tyrian shekel it was called because of the amount of silver in it. But if you need to get the right coin, they will charge you interest. And the amount of interest is the equivalent of about two hours worth of work for a common laborer. Every half shekel that you get back in change if you have larger bills or larger coin, really, they didn't have bills, larger coin, would cost you the same amount, the equivalent of two hours worth of labor for a common worker. Exorbitant rates they would charge. They were capitalizing, no, they were extorting people's desire to worship God. They wanted to be there. They wanted to worship God. Not only that, but we are told by history that 
there were rabbinical schools that taught priests how to look at lambs to see if they were clean or unclean. And the training was 18 months on a special farm where they would be able to look for defects, acquired or inherent, or if you brought what you thought was a perfect lamb and your rabbi in town, wherever you're from, said it was great, they might look at it and say, well, there's a problem. You go, what do you mean a problem? It's perfect. They told me back home it was perfect. I know, but look here, look, 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 look. And they point something at you go, I can't see anything. I know, but I've been trained, I can see it. I'm sorry we can't sacrifice this. You have to buy one of our little sheepies, our lambs. Jesus observed this. It was a racket. Sort of like going to the movies, you know, you, you pay $10 for the ticket, but popcorn and a Coke is, what, 250 bucks. You know, it's, <laughs> it's crazy by the time you have a night out at the movies. And they know they got you. Am I right? It's not worth even half of what they charge at the movies. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm done there. <laughs> now, when I read this story, I think of something that Charles Wesley wrote in the 1700s. It became a song, and it became a very popular little statement. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon this little child. Jesus was meek, and he was mild. He even said that he was, and he was seen by the crowds as somebody who was meek and lowly in heart. But not when it came to hypocrites. When it came to hypocrites or those who violated the holiness of God and the desire for people to sincerely worship, he wasn't gentle, Jesus, meek and mild. He was fatal, Jesus, angry and wild. He'd come at you. He'd unleash the fury of God. And that's an attribute that many, especially unbelievers, don't want to believe that Jesus exhibited. Oh, you know, be like Jesus. That means just sort of roll over and say nothing, do nothing. He just let anything go. Did he? In Revelation, during the tribulation period, the people on earth will hide in rocks and in caves saying, save us, listen to this, from the wrath of the Lamb. Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Have you ever seen an angry lamb? Look out. He's got a lamb, right? Beware of lamb. You ever see that on a, on a fence? Lambo. Attack sheep. The wrath of the lamb? Yes, this is the lamb of God, the gentle Jesus, who one day will come back in fury and in judgment. So Jesus in the temple. Verse 13, and he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. He's quoting from Jeremiah chapter seven. And then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Notice the difference. On one hand, he's angry, rightfully so, righteously so. On the other hand, he's very mild and meek and receives those who know they have a need and they come to Jesus and he willingly accepts them and transforms their life. Now, I mentioned that Jesus is quoting and Matthew says that Jesus said, it is written, my father's house will be called a house of prayer. He's quoting from one of the most famous sermons the prophet Jeremiah ever gave in Jeremiah chapter seven. God says, Jeremiah, go stand in the temple courts in front of the opening to the temple. And when people come in, I want you to yell. I want you to proclaim and say this. Don't trust in lying vanities saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. It goes on to say, my father's house, or my house, God the Father says, shall be called a house of prayer. So what you had in Jeremiah's time was a group of religious people who were hiding behind their rituals and their place of worship, just like a lot of people today say, well, I go to church. Are you saved, you ask them? Well, I go to church, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. I've been baptized. I've been confirmed. Do you follow Jesus? Are you born-again Christian? Ritual can cover up a wicked heart. 
People can go through the ritual, keep the religious observance, and think, I feel good about myself. I've done this for the Lord. I'm okay now. And that's why God said, Jeremiah, give it to them straight. They can't trust in the temple of the Lord anymore or keeping these sacrifices. I've always found it interesting. Isaiah's had a very similar ministry. And sorry to be hopping over the Bible, but I find it helpful to take verses of Scripture, stories in the Bible, and see how they relate to the whole Bible. In Isaiah chapter 1, God says to the prophet and through the prophet to the people, quit bringing me sacrifices. I'm sick of it. When you make your long prayers for your new moons and your Sabbaths, my soul hates your sacrifices. I won't listen to your dumb prayers anymore. I remember when I first read that, I go, whoa, wait a minute. You're the one who told us or told them to make sacrifices and prayers on the new moon and the Sabbath. Now you're saying, I'm sick of it. I don't want it. Why? Because it was all outward, not inward. It was all ritual. It wasn't relationship or real or authentic. It wasn't a real submission or surrender to God, simply outward. So Jesus is quoting from that famous sermon saying, my father's house shall be called the house of prayer. And astute Jewish leaders would have recognized that. Verse 15, but when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Isn't this cool? The children, now this is the following day after Jesus came into Jerusalem, the next day. The next day Jesus is in the temple doing marvelous things and the kids are there, little children going, Hosanna, Hosanna. Where'd they learn that? From hearing their parents the day before. Your children, our children and grandchildren, watch our lives very keenly. They watch our attitudes toward God, toward going to church, toward reading the Bible, toward devotions, things we say about God or to God. They listen very carefully. Their parents the day before it said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the son of David. The kids heard that, and so the next day, probably just playing around, Hosanna, Hosanna. But it was beautiful. They were emulating their parents. It's always been a lesson to me, this verse, to be very careful how we live and what we say. You know, sometimes a, a grown-up will say a certain word and then say something really lame afterwards, like, pardon my French. Okay, excuse me, it wasn't French, it was English. Everybody knows that word. <laughs> but then your son or your daughter hears that. And what do you tell them? Well, don't say that. Don't, don't you say that. That's an adult word. No, it's a word for somebody who doesn't really have an IQ. <laughs> Can't really think of anything but some stupid fill-in word like that. Hosanna, they said. And he said to them, verse 16, do you hear? They said to him, do you hear what, what these are saying? Of course, now they knew what that meant. They knew Psalm 8, 118, that Hallel Psalm. They knew it. They knew it was a messianic song. They knew what the crowd was asking for. And now look, now the kids are perverted and corrupted. Do you hear what they're saying? Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read? <laughs> I've always loved that question he asked. Hey, you religious leaders, do you ever read your own scriptures? Have you never read, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise? These kids were just saying what their parents said. They had no theological background. They couldn't read or write, but that was perfect. They emulated what had been taught them by their parents. That's perfect praise. And he left them, and he went out of the city to Bethany, back again to the other side of that Mount of Olives where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. 
And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And he turned to it and said, let no fruit grow on you ever again. It says immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled. I would too. I still do, and I'm just reading it. And they were saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? Now, please don't get the idea that Jesus just like has a vendetta on fig trees. Like, I don't like figs. <laughs> it's an object lesson. He had been to the temple. He found no fruit. He'd been there at the beginning of his ministry, overturned the tables. It's been three and a half years. He's back again. There's no fruit at the beginning or at the end. Now think of that. Two times he went, no fruit. In that part of the world, there's a lot of figs. My favorite area to see them is up north at Caesarea Philippi. But figs produce fruit twice. There's an early edible fruit that even comes to the tree before the leaves are fully uh, pushed out. And the early fruit is a harbinger of future normal fruit, the bigger fruit. It's, it's, it's an indication if you see the little ones coming out, the big ones are coming later. If you come and there's no little ones, there's going to be no big ones. Now Mark 11 tells us it wasn't fig season yet. So people read and go, so, so why would he so, be so bummed out at a fig tree if there's not even fig season? Because the fact that there were no early figs, which would indicate you're going to have the later figs, shows that it's not bearing fruit. It's a picture of that nation and those leaders. He came to the Lord's house, the temple, the nation. They represented the nation. He found nothing but leaves, an outward profession. But he found no fruit, no early fruit, and thus no later fruit. And so he cursed that fig tree. By the way, there are two prophets in the Old Testament. Hosea is one. Joel is another. Both of those prophets use the fig or the fig tree as a symbol of the nation of Israel. In the same sentences where those are used in those prophetic books, the vine, the grape, the vineyard, which is a well-known, well-established picture of the nation of Israel, and the fig tree are pictured together. So it's a picture of the nation of Israel. And Jesus pronounces a curse on that. This is a object lesson and a prediction of what's going to happen in 70 AD when the Romans come in and destroy that city. It's cursed. Now, I, wa I, I don't want you to go crazy with this thought. Because the early church was all Jewish. All Jewish. But it was the Lord's heart to get the gospel out to the world. Jesus said, go out into all the world. Paul went to the Jew first and also to the Gentile or Greek. When the Jews repeatedly didn't want to hear them, you know what Paul did. He would, you know, bang his feet, like knock the dust off his feet and say, from now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. And they listened. Most of Paul's fruit was in non-Jewish areas, and they received the gospel more readily than the Jewish people. Now, the Bible promises that Israel has been hardened as a nation until the full number of Gentiles be gathered in. Then God says, I'm going to work again with the house of Israel. So, if you see what happens in the book of Revelation, that after the rapture of the church, I believe that's my eschatology, after the rapture of the church, during the tribulation period, that's when the real outpouring, even though we're seeing more Jewish believers today than ever before in the land of Israel, it doesn't compare to what's going to happen in the book of Revelation, there's going to be 144,000 believers who become evangelists who get the gospel through their lips. Imagine 144,000 Paul the Apostles. Be an irresistible force. So that 
a huge innumerable multitude, the souls under the altar, are the Gentile and the Gentile nations that receive the gospel through their witness. So when he curses the nation, he is predicting the fall of Jerusalem and the temporary setting aside of Israel, but looking for the future regathering. Verse 21, Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. I will admit that this verse seems at first glance to be strange, almost like it doesn't belong here. Almost as if Jesus is sort of giving us a formula. You too can curse fig trees. Oh, and by the way, move mountains. So a little background is helpful. There was a phrase in Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, where they would call a certain gifted teacher the remover of mountains or the uprooter of mountains. If he was particularly gifted and was able to unravel difficult passages or difficult problems, certain rabbis were called the rooter up of the mountains. Now, the context here is Jesus is teaching how to not be under God's curse, which is faith, a life of faith, if you believe. He's telling them, I believe, about removing obstacles, primarily removing obstacles to a life of faith. Now hold that thought. In the book of Zechariah, the prophecy of Zechariah in the Old Testament, God predicted that the governor of the town named Zerubbabel is going to build a temple. And this is what he says. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. In other words, not nothing nor no one is going to get in the way of God doing what he wants to do and building that temple through that guy Zerubbabel. Every obstacle is going to be removed. The mountain is, itself is going to be moved and become a plain. You see that figure of speech. However, Jesus does apply this to prayer. If whatever you ask in prayer. So I can't deny that he's talking about us in our prayer lives. But without going through every scripture that we could bring to bear on this, we have to presuppose that God answers all prayer that is according to his will. So that whenever you ask anything that is on target with what he wants, going to be done, nothing's going to get in the way, nothing's going to be an obstacle. So ask it in faith. As James said, nothing wavering. Doesn't mean that God, at any whim of yours, whatever you name and claim, you're going to get. Some people treat God like he's some divine bellboy. Like you call room service, you just sort of name what you want and at your beck and call, they'll run up to the room and get you whatever you need. God answers every prayer. Sometimes his answer is no. Last time I checked, that's an answer too. Might not be the one you wanted or were looking for, but it's an answer. So this presupposes that you're praying according to his will and every obstacle is removed. Now, when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? What things? Teaching the people in the temple. Overturning the tables of the money changers. The triumphal entry, what happened a couple days before this. So, by what authority do you do these things and who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I will ask you one thing. Which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves saying, hmm. Well, if we say from heaven, he's going to say to us, why didn't you believe him then? But if we say from men, we're afraid of these guys, that we fear the multitude for, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, 
We don't know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. <laughs> I love this. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to trap Jesus. By what authority do you do these, do you do these things? Who gave you the authority? If you were to answer plainly and honestly, they would go at him. If he would have said, my authority comes from my heavenly Father who sent me from heaven to earth as your Messiah, I have full and legitimate claim and right as the future king of Israel and the world to do this. So they're trying to trap him. So he's not being evasive, he's being wise. Wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. So he brings up John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist was very notable uh, people from all over Judea, you remember in Jerusalem, all s swarmed down to the Jordan River because this guy was radical. Uncompromising preacher, he would, he would baptize people in the river. That they were used to. They were used to a baptism. By the way, uh, baptism comes from a Jewish practice that predates the New Testament. I don't know if you're aware of that. But you can go to Israel today, and those of you who are with us, you know exactly what I'm talking about. As you're going up to the southern steps, um, in Jerusalem on that Temple Mount, there's all sorts of holes dug out called the mikvah, or the mikvahot is the plural, which are holes dug out that held water where people would immerse themselves in the water for ritual purification before going up to the temple to worship. It was the baptism. They would be baptized and go worship. John the Baptist, though, was different. And the reason people were going to hear him because they thought he may be the Messiah because this guy isn't saying just get wet and go through a ritual. He's saying change your life and repent. So the people regarded him as a prophet. So he brings up John the Baptist. And I love it because Jesus has them now on a, the horns of a dilemma. We call this in chess check mate. By what authority do you do these things? Check. Let me ask you a question. What do you think of John? Check mate. We don't know. Okay, I'm done here. See ya. And he moves on. Now, he doesn't leave it there. He goes on now to expose their dishonesty by giving them a story, a parable. Verse 28. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first, and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered, and he said, I will not. But afterwards he regretted, and he went. Came to his second son and said likewise. And he answered and said, I, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Do you think that offended them? <laughs> you know, if Jesus were a pastor of a church, he'd get all sorts of notes for that one. Man, that was a little too heavy there, preacher. My friend's not coming back because you said that. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterwards relent and believe. And then he said, here another parable. And... Judging from the time, we're going to have to hear another parable at another time. But going back to that first parable that we just read, we'll just close on that one and give a few thoughts to go home with. The tax collectors that he refers to, the IRS agents that nobody liked because they work for the Roman government, you know their story, and the harlots that he mentions, they're like the first son. They heard and they go, yeah, it's not for me, whatever. But later on, they had a change of heart, a repentance, 
and they did the will of the Father by receiving Christ. Whereas the religious leaders are like this second son in the parable. That is, they're not saying anything negative about John the Baptist. They're just saying, well, we don't know. We know he's very famous and he's a very controversial figure. We don't know. But they're not willing to do the will of the Father, which is have men and women come to Christ, his Son, the Savior. They're not willing to repent. So out and out sinners will enter the kingdom of God, but self-righteous religionists won't get in. A couple years ago, I was invited in upstate New York to visit a very infamous criminal called the Son of Sam, David Berkowitz. He had heard our radio broadcast, and he asked if I was in the area if I'd stop in and see him. He's in life, several life imprisonments. Notorious serial killer. Movies have been made out of him. Books have been written about him. He was a terror in New York years ago. So there I am in prison, and right across from me, I'm looking eye to eye with the son of Sam, the serial killer, who has since given his heart to Christ, is living out the rest of his life in a prison, and when he was up for parole last time, he told the judge, I don't want to get out. I don't deserve to get out. I deserve death or a life sentence for what I've done. Besides that, I feel I have a very important prison ministry right here that I want to continue. He's genuine. But I'm, I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, imagine telling this story to the secularist or the religionist who says, you know, I've been good and upright and gone to church all my life and been baptized and been confirmed and have kept the sacraments. But it's, it's not a repentance of heart. It's just outward ritual to say to them, you're not going to heaven. The serial killer is. That, that would like blow a fuse. It's like, it, it's the worst thing they can hear. They don't get that. They don't get that. You come poor in spirit and you confess who you are and you might be like the harlot and the tax collector, I don't need that stuff, but eventually you have a change of heart and you ask for forgiveness and God says, I do forgive you based on what my son did. Come on into heaven. But the person who goes to the temple or goes to the church and goes to the ritual and trusts in himself will not go to heaven. Jesus said, those harlots are going to get to heaven for you guys. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and harlots believed. When you saw it, you did not afterwards repent and believe. Remember Jesus said, we already covered in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. It's not what you say. It's what you do when Christ changes you. You're not saved by what you do. You're saved by what he does, but then you do change because he's changed you from the inside out. Father, we want to leave that right there tonight and think on one hand what a rebuke it is to the self-styled, self-promoting self-reliant and self-righteous, ritualist and religionist, but what a breath of fresh air it is to the person who knows they need your help and who would say, yep, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. And it could be, Lord, that there are some who are here tonight or listening by radio or watching over the internet who have come to the same conclusion that they're a sinner in need of forgiveness and it's the forgiveness that comes from God through Jesus Christ. You can change that life if that person will surrender to you. Truth is, we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of your glory. We all need your forgiveness. Some admit it, some don't. Some come, 
Some don't. Some say nice things, but don't really live or surrender to your ways, your spirit, your truth. There's no heart change. I pray for anyone who might be here right now on this campus, in this auditorium, in our family room, up in the balcony, even outside or listening in overflow, who doesn't personally know Jesus as Savior. I pray that tonight, like that first son who said, nope, but later had a change of heart, that tonight would be the change of heart when there would be genuine surrender and repentance. And they'd experience your grace, your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.